Okay. All right. So again, um, this explains why uh, we have to disguise animal flesh in order to make it acceptable to us as humans, because we really try to make it look like the plant foods that our brain really wants to eat. And that's what this little video points out to you, that we shape animal tissue to mimic plant parts. Um, because unlike true carnivores, we really don't want to be eating dead animal tissue. And uh, so this is meat eating and mind games, exploring the psychology of the human disgust emotion and why we have to disguise animal flesh in order to make it desirable. And this is a quote from the book of Revelation. It says, and the Lord showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal. And on either side of the river were the trees of life, which bear 12 manner of fruits and the leaves of the trees were for the healing of the nations. That's Revelation 22 verses one and two. So, uh, in this lecture, we will see that humans have the palate of an herbivore, of a plant-based uh, creature. We actually love and crave the taste, textures, colors, and varieties of plant foods. And although people often eat meat um, out of a learned uh, tradition and uh, cultural behavior, the fact is we really don't like it. And that's why we are compelled to change its form, taste, and texture to make it acceptable and palatable to us. This lecture explores what our biology and psychology are trying to tell us about who we are as a species and what we should eat as opposed to what many of us choose to eat. So first, we are going to look at the psychology and neurobiology of the human disgust response. So let's ask the most basic question. What is disgust? Disgust is a universal human emotion with a very characteristic facial expression that is absolutely recognized across all human cultures. The disgust reflex is present in infants and it's believed to be one of the six basic human emotions. Now, we all recognize that facial expression. I choose to believe that they are actually feeding that poor child eggplant because that is exactly the same expression I make when people feed me eggplant. The other five emotions that we are all born with are happiness, sadness, fear, anger, and surprise. Again, these are emotions we're all born with. We don't have to learn them. And from a teleological standpoint, all six of these emotions mediate appropriate interactions between individuals and the environment and among individuals within the social group. And they are important because these basic emotions serve to facilitate survival for both individuals and for the larger social group. So we need all of these emotions to help us survive, both as individuals and as a social group, because without them, we wouldn't know how to navigate our environment in ways that would keep us alive, nor would we be able to um, appropriately interact with each other in ways that would help us survive as uh, a species and uh, a uh, social enterprise. Disgust is therefore a hardwired neural phenomenon that is an important survival reflex. Disgust improves survival both for individuals and for the group by facilitating the rapid acquisition of persistent avoidance behaviors to potentially harmful phenomena. Now, what does that mean in plain English? Um, we'll see what that means. MRI studies of the brain have shown that the disgust reflex is located in a part of the brain called the anterior insular cortex, which the arrow is pointing to. And that area of the brain is also important in other uh, stomach and GI related functions, such as recognizing unpleasant taste, uh, the nausea sensation, and uh, stomach sensations such as dyspepsia. 
Disgust is distinguishable from fear in that while fear heightens activity in preparation for fight or flight, disgust is uh, interesting because it promotes the suspension of activity. So for instance, if you're sitting in a room and something scary breaks into that room, like uh, a rabid dog or a bear or say, Donald Trump, you will suddenly jump up and become, you know, ready to either fight your way out of the room or run for your life. Well, disgust is different because disgust exerts strong negative effects on your uh, behavior that will cause you to stop doing something. And those effects can be permanent and absolutely defy reason. Well, what do I mean? Well, think about the last time you dropped your toothbrush in the toilet. Even if someone fished that uh, toothbrush out of the toilet, steam cleaned it with bleach, I don't think you would ever put it back in your mouth because you would just be entirely too disgusted. Although um, you would know in your mind that it was clean and free of, you know, any potentially disease-causing bacteria, the thought of putting it in your mouth would be so disgusting, you couldn't bring yourself to do it. And that's how strong the disgust reflex is, that it can literally override our reason and be uh, and permanently prevent us from uh, engaging in a behavior. So the biological origin and purpose of the disgust facial expression and reflex is to cause us to reject and eject potentially harmful items before they call, cause ill health, and then to rapidly transfer that learned avoidance behavior to the larger social group. So in other words, if we are out in our environment and we're walking together and you see your friend pick up something that looks like it might be good to eat and they bite into it and all of a sudden they get this horrible, disgusted look on their face and they face it and they spit it out and they go, it's horrible. You don't feel the need to go and pick that same item up and put it in your mouth because you can tell from their reaction and facial expression that that is not something you should even attempt to eat. So from their reaction, from their facial expression, you have been protected from being potentially exposed to to something that could harm your health. Well, it turns out that there are actually three domains of disgust. Uh, Current theories um, argue that the uh, emotion of disgust has three functional domains. There is pathogen disgust, which is the subject of this lecture, but importantly, there's also moral disgust and sexual disgust. I'm taking a quick drink of water. Again, pathogen disgust is the principal subject of this lecture and primarily concerns itself with protecting both the individual and our social group from agents or behaviors that represent a proximal and imminent threat to life, limb, or health, and possibly social order. Moral disgust pertains to social transgressions and antisocial behaviors, such as lying, stealing, cheating, meanness, cruelty, and violence towards others. I might also add social insurrection and attempting to overthrow one's own government. The anti-cruelty and violence aspects of moral disgust will also be addressed to some extent in this lecture, but you can... um, Uh, quickly understand that moral disgust is critically important for any social dwelling uh, um, uh, organism or species, because if you don't have um, uh, rules and and, uh, some sort of code of behavior that limits your aggressive uh, activities towards your the, the, the uh, individuals that you share um, living space with, you could quickly end up killing each other and destroying your social cohesiveness. Sexual disgust concerns itself with the avoidance of unfavorable se- sexual pairings that could ultimately result in less viable offspring and end up causing the social group 
to die out from becoming weakened genetically and thus uh, subject to, um, you know, infectious agents that w- could kill off uh, everybody else. So things like incest um, or um, that sick feeling you uh, get when you used to see Hugh Hefner with some, you know, 20 year old bimbo or um, when you uh, would see, um I don't know, Donald Trump with Marla Maples or someone, um, that is uh, uh, sexual disgust. It pedophilia, that, that the, the uh, disgust we feel when we see uh, um, uh, very old persons with very young persons, that uh, there's something that tells you that that is not appropriate. And that uh, um, um, is uh, where uh, the, the sexual disgust comes from. So um, clearly there is wide personal and cultural variation in what is found to be disgusting. Uh, As previously discussed, disgust not only encompasses dietary issues, but uh, but it also has a very strong social and moral component. And again, my personal list of what I find disgusting are people who are racist and the people who tolerate and excuse them, Uh, people who reprobate children from their parents and put them in cages and then try to claim that such behavior is consistent with the teachings of Jesus Christ um, or uh, biblical uh, uh, um, uh, provisions for taking care of strangers and anyone who engages in anti-democratic tactics um, in an attempt to keep a lawless um, orange-colored criminal in the White House um, and try to put in place uh, laws that deny citizens the right to vote to, again, keep... um, neo-fascists in office. Those are things I personally find very disgusting. But um, studies have shown that there are elicitors of pathogen disgust that are uh, consistent across cultures. So, you know, again, there are certain behaviors that may be found um, disgusting in one culture or in one household that, you know, in another culture or another household aren't Uh, found disgusting. But interestingly, studies have shown that there are certain things that in every culture looked at around the globe, these same uh, uh, um, uh, uh, issues or, or features, all human beings tend to find disgusting. And what are those features? Well, the qualities are things that are found disgusting across Um, uh, most or all cultures uh, um, uh, around the world are things that are moist or slimy, wet, things that have a soft, sticky, greasy or oily quality to them, things that are squishy, putrid or foul, things that have a very asymmetric or amorphous shape, things covered with flies, things that are bloody, things that are decaying or rotting, uh, things that are, have animal effluent uh, in them or around them, things covered with hair or fur, things that are gory or covered with worms or maggots, uh, indica- indicating that they are, are rotting and decaying. And I remember once uh, um, when I was giving this lecture, uh, a, a woman raised her hand and she said, well, Dr. Mills, I don't think hair is uh, disgusting. I said, okay, um, let me uh, uh, bring you a bowl of soup and I'll put a great big hair in it and we'll see if you find that uh, appetizing. Um, and, and so clearly um, um, uh, she, got, she got the point that uh, yes, when, uh, 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 when it comes to things that we are going to ingest, uh, human beings do not want them covered with hair and fur. Um, and um, I think if you just uh, step back and look at this list, um, it should start to become clear to you that what this list is describing um, is um, uh, unprocessed raw animal tissue, largely, and certainly animal tissue that has been left um, to start the decay process. And um, it's letting you know that our brains are trying to tell us we shouldn't be ingesting unprocessed uh, animal tissue. But let's go ahead and move on. So now let's talk about how we sense and perceive food. 
because clearly um, that will determine what we eat and how do we know what we should eat. But to understand how we recognize and identify things that are disgusting, we first have to understand how our brains see and perceive. By the time we actually become aware of what it, whatever it is that we're looking at, a lot of actual pre-conscious visual processing has already taken place in our brains. Before we become consciously aware of something, our subconscious brain actually recognizes the salient features of the object we're looking at, and it automatically routes the visual information to appropriate conscious recognition, uh, uh, brain recognition centers, and that then will tell us what we're looking at, and this is illustrated by how we see and perceive faces. Now, by the time you actually became aware of that picture, not only did you know you were looking at a face, but you also knew whose face you were looking at. And that's because in all of our brains, not only do we have facial recognition centers, but those centers are connected to memory cells that recognize specific faces. So that by the time that information is forwarded to the conscious centers uh, in our forebrains, we already know who we are looking at. And the, the, that ability of recognizing uh, um, faces is so strong, we even recognize this cartoon as being the same person uh, 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 in the actual photo. Our propensity to see faces is so strong we are able to see faces in line drawings and even in the craters of the moon. And that's because, again, our brain is hardwired to see faces because faces are so important in our social interactions. Well, correctly identifying and appropriately responding to potentially nutritious food items is also critically important because an inappropriate disgust response to food will lead to an eating disorder, which will lead to starvation, will, which will lead to death. And that kind of seems um, almost um, intuitive or uh, axiomatic, but you really have to step back and think about that. Because if we as individuals or as a species are not able to recognize what is food, we won't know what to eat. And if we don't know what to eat, then we will starve to death. And this is actually illustrated um, in the eating disorder, anorexia nervosa, because the fundamental defect in that eating disorder is that the women, or excuse me, let me not just say women, because we now see that um, uh, even young men uh, with body dysmorphic uh, disorder um, can develop uh, have developed anorexia nervosa, they actually develop an, what's uh, considered an inappropriate disgust response to food. And even though they are actually starving to death, when they look at food, they are so disgusted by the idea of eating that they have literally no desire to consume food and they will just waste away until they can actually starve themselves to death. And so it is truly possible that if you cannot recognize uh, food as being necessary and nutritious, that, uh, and if you develop a dis an inappropriate disgust response to a food item, that you will not want to eat, and if you don't want to eat, you will starve to death. Well, the, rec the mechanisms that we use to recognize food are similar to those we use to identify, uh, or excuse me, the mechanisms we use to recognize faces are similar to those we use to recognize uh, and identify uh, food. To avoid evoking a disgust response to potentially nutritious food, our brain uses pre-conscious visual cues to invoke what um, I call food interest attention to appropriate items. Uh, 
The brain is able to do this because of the perceptive properties of the human eye and the, and the neural wiring of our visual cortex. The human eye is designed to perceive color and very fine detail. And, you know, people often try and compare human eyes to carnivores because we have binocular vision. Carnivores have binocular vision, but the human eye is, is very, very, very different from the eyes of carnivores. And it's, uh, you know, thinking that just because we have binocular vision and carnivores have binocular vision, that that means that our eyes are the same would be like saying, well, eagles have wings and hummingbirds have wings, therefore they eat the same food. It's an idiotic premise. Um, the wings of eagles are, are very different from the wings of uh, uh, hummingbirds, and so are the eyes of uh, humans and carnivores. Again, the human eye is designed to perceive color and fine detail. Carnivores don't see color. They see in black and white, and I'll talk about their eyes a little more, uh, and they also don't see, see detail very well. I'll talk about that uh, um, a little bit more later. Um, and the color, uh, the reason we, we perceive color is because uh, as a plant-based species, color is extremely important um, for us because plants signal the edibility of their edible parts with color. When the, the, their plant parts are at a state where they are not ready to be eaten, the plants um, um, will uh, have them in a color phase that says, don't eat this yet. It will be bitter. It will be toxic. It is not something you should consume. Um, and it turns out that much of our incredible visual processing uh, ability comes from the stupendous computing power of our visual cortex. Now, one of the things that I want you to notice from this picture of the human eye is that the, uh, that the human eye has an area in the back of the retina called the fovea, which is a pit located at the back of the retina that contains the highest concentration of what are called cone photoreceptors. It is the cone photoreceptors that give us both the uh, ability to see very fine detail, but also color vision because uh, uh, the cones come in three different varieties and it is the um, three different, the combination of uh, the three uh, um, primary colors that gives us all of the uh, various uh, uh, colors that we see. 70%, and this is amazing, 70% of the neurons in the brain, in the human brain, um, which is proportionately the largest brain of any animal on the planet, uh, are connected in some way to our visual cortex. Uh, humans can see a range of over 10 million different hues. Uh, we can rapidly shift from deep to near focus, as well as easily, easily switch from panoramic viewing to looking at something in exquisitely fine detail. And um, we likely um, see um, um, and greater uh, um, close in uh, um, uh, color and hue discrimination than possibly any other animals. Now it's, it is true that um, uh, birds and raptors are able to um, uh, see uh, um, uh, um, much uh, uh, greater, uh, um, uh, they, they have kind of like super binocular uh, uh, um, uh, vision in terms of being able to see things uh, from much greater distances, but it's unclear if they are able to see the kind of color discrimination uh, um, and uh, so forth that we are able to see. Um, and it's likely that they don't because it wouldn't be important to them uh, for finding food since they are not looking for uh, food from, uh, um, uh, from plants. Hummingbirds might though, um, that's something uh, that'd be interesting to find out. Our visual neuro neural wiring causes us to see and perceive schema, looking for patterns and forms in the detailed information picked up by our phobia. And this kind of vision is very helpful when looking for food from plant sources, since plants 
tend to package their edible parts in very showy and stereotypical forms, such as fruit, seeds, pods, leaves, roots, tubers, and so forth. And although, uh, as I mentioned earlier, mammalian carnivores do have binocular vision like us, their eyes are constructed very, very differently from ours, and they see the world in a very different manner than we do. Pattern oriented color vision would be a distinct disadvantage for a predator because it is actually more easily deceived by camouflage. The eyes of carnivores don't have trichromatic color vision because their retinas uh, only have a limited number of one uh, or possibly two, type of two types of cone photoreceptors. Um, their eyes contain mainly the monochromatic rod photoreceptors that function best at night because they typically are active at night. Um, they also have a layer of um, mirror-like reflective cells at the back of the eye behind the rep their retinas called the tapetum lucidum that amplify low light levels. And that's why if you shine a um, flashlight into your dog or your cat's eyes or other carnivore's eyes, their eyes light up um, uh, because of the, that mirror at the back of the retina. Uh, and that is what allows them to see well uh, in the dark. They have their own built-in uh, night vision goggles. And then instead of a pit at the back of their retina that giving them a uh, discrete uh, um, detailed vision, they have what's called a linear strip that runs in a horizontal uh, um, uh, streak along the back of um, their retina. It's called the visual streak. And that visual streak means that anything moving across that visual streak will stimulate them to go into chase mode. Um, and it allows them to easily track movement, but it will also cause them to chase anything moving across the uh, visual street. And that's another reason they tell you if you're ever confronted by a carnivore out in the wild, never run from the animal because they're going to chase you. They can't help it. it, it they're hardwired to chase things that move across that visual streak. And uh, again, as I said, that tapetum lucidum, uh, that mirror in the back of their eyes is what amplifies uh, any light entering their uh, retina and um, gives them such good vision at night. Uh, and they see uh, six times better than we do. And they literally have built in night vision goggles. Carnivores see in a black and white pixel mosaic that, again, is geared towards detecting movement. So when things move across that mosaic, they pick it up very, very easily. And so for carnivores, motion, anything moving is the visual cue that stimulates food interest attention in them, which makes perfect sense because they're trying to find something to eat and they're trying to find something living that they can kill and eat. Predators are hardwired to chase anything that moves because if something is moving, it can probably be eaten. Um, and uh, carnivores don't have a catalog of edible animals um, in their brains um, or a list of, you know, what species exist. So they have to be ready and able to chase anything that's moving and to kill it and uh, see if it uh, 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 is edible. And that's why they chase balls and, and, and ropes and uh, even cars and tires because, you know, they have to be ready to chase down anything that comes across their path that's moving to see if it's edible and can be eaten. Um, because that's how Mother Nature designed them or God. Uh, um, um, if you happen to, to um, believe in God as I do, um, uh, so that, uh, you know, they could be always out looking for a meal. Often carnivores and true carnivores will actually begin feeding on their prey while it is still alive and moving, which for um, uh, human beings would be incredibly gross and hideous to do something like that. Natural meat eaters are actually stimulated by bloody raw flesh and true predators always willingly eat putrid rotting flesh and in fact um that is something that attracts them um uh because they have the 
stomach acid and the immune system to deal with the pathogens uh, uh, in uh, rotting tissue without becoming sick. These animals will kill without reservation or remorse. And if the prey is perceived to be weak, sick, or vulnerable, um, like uh, young or very old or disabled animals, that will make them uh, chase and kill the animal even that much more. Whereas for human beings, because of our moral disgust impulse, uh, attacking weak, sick, or vulnerable individuals generally uh, is viewed as abhorrent uh, um, within uh, our societies, um, unless you happen to belong to the GOP. Now, again, when you contrast that, that with the way humans see and perceive food, it turns out that for us, we look for something very different. Edible plant parts are generally very brightly colored, smooth edged, discreetly shaped objects that are small enough to be held in our hands. And so in order for items to be see perceived as potential food sources, therefore, they must be smooth edged, discreetly shaped, symmetrical, and preferably hand sized and colorful. Keep that in mind, okay? Edible plant parts, generally brightly colored, smooth edged, discreetly shaped objects, small enough to be held in the hand. And so for items to be perceived as potential food uh, sources for us, they must be smooth edged, discreetly shaped, symmetrical, and uh, hand sized and colorful. Those are the characteristics that our brains perceive as uh, uh, visual cues that signal food, and good food, um, and therefore stimulate food interest attention in us. And that may be one of the reasons that women paint their lips like this luscious, ripe red color, because it's very likely that that full red lips mimics the, the appeal of ripe fruit and will stimulate uh, men or if they are and their girlfriends to want to you know, kind of eat or kiss the lips. And although sight, uh, this is from uh, uh, Scientific American, says although sight plays a less direct role than smell and the perception of flavor, sight is the sense most often used to identify food in humans. And it thereby affects the expectation of the food's attributes. And so just imagine that you're, out uh, hiking with some friends and you guys kind of get lost and um, you don't uh, and you you guys are hungry. You're not sure where you are. Um, uh, and all of a sudden you look out in the distance and you say, oh, man, look, there's a tree and it's got a, a bunch of red round things on it. And uh, immediately you start to get hungry because you think that that tree is loaded with fruit. Um, and, and so you start heading out in that direction. And your expectation is that you are going to get some nice, delicious apples because of those red round objects uh, 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 in that tree. Um, and uh, because that the sight of the red round object stimulates food interest attention in you. And here's just some pictures of edible plant parts showing that they are smooth edge, brightly colored, discreetly shaped. Here's some more uh, edible plant parts. And uh, in addition to this, for an object to be perceived as food, it must not only have the uh, characteristics you just mentioned, but it must also have the smell, taste, and texture of plant and plant parts. And very importantly, it must not be moving. Nobody wants the food on their plate, squirming around, looking at them and screaming. That is just a hideous idea. So let's look at food choices and disgust. So reviewing those elicitors of disgust that all human cultures find disgusting, we see, again, things that are moist, slimy, wet, soft, sticky, greasy, oily, squishy, 
putrid and foul, things that are asymmetric, amorphous in their shape, things covered with flies, blood, uh, things that are decaying or rotting, uh, things that are uh, uh, surrounded by animal effluent or covered with hair and fur, things that are gory and covered with worms and maggots. All right. So let's first look at things that are bloody, gory, and uh, filled with violence. Well, it turns out that human beings uh, are also born with what's called the blood uh, injury phobia. It has long been recognized that humans have an innate aversion uh, that is disgust response to the sight of blood and dismemberment. Over 500 years ago, Shakespeare wrote, many will swoon, that is faint, when they do see blood. That's from his play, As You Like It. Lightheadedness or fainting at the sight of blood and dismemberment is equally common in both men and women. And as uh, someone who's gone through medical school, I can tell you, um, the men would almost pass out more uh, often and quickly than the women. Um, And as she says, you think? Uh, (laughs) Studies show that this loss of consciousness or lightheadedness is the result of a central nervous system reflex that causes a drop in heart rate and blood pressure that leads to decreased perfusion of the brain. And that is what uh, causes the fainting. Research has shown that this uh, CNS mediated decrease in heart rate and blood pressure upon seeing blood violence and or injury is present from an early age and is therefore believed to be the normal response for human beings. So in other words, this is not something that someone taught us. This is not something we had to learn. This is, we're all born with this, that when we see blood, we are uh, um, uh, repulsed by it. And it, it makes us like kind of lightheaded and nauseous and, 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 and uh, um, uh, want to, to, to turn away from it. Is there any scientific data to support that view? Well, of course there is. And this is from a study uh, called The Effect of Muscular Reactivity as Evidenced by Flow-Mediated Dilation. Um, I want to give credit to Dr. Jeffrey Novick, um, brilliant uh, nutritionist. Uh, He shared this uh, slide with me. um, And it uh, came from a study where uh, they showed a group of volunteers, two movies. One of them is a comedy called Kingpin, starring Woody Harrelson, who happens to be vegan, by the way. And the other uh, was the movie Saving Private Ryan, which if you've ever seen that movie, you know it is extremely violent and graphic in terms of the type of carnage that it showed. And uh, they measured the... um, vascular reactivity in the uh, people watching the movie um, and and showed what happened in the blood flow in their blood vessels as uh, they watched these movies and afterwards. And this is what they found, that pre and post laughter in uh, um, after watching the comedy for the vast majority of the individuals watching the comedy the um, amount of blood flowing through their arteries increased by an average of 22%. Now, if you look, there was this one individual who um, his uh, blood flow actually decreased from watching a comedy, and that guy might be a future serial killer. I don't know. Um, But um, (laughs) for the people who watched the watch the very distressing and anguish producing um, uh, Saving Private Ryan, blood flow decreased by an average of 35%. Again, except for if you look towards the top, there's one person whose blood flow shot up after watching all of that violence and, 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 and uh, gore. And um, Um, they should have reported him to the authorities, but anyway, um, but you can see in general, human beings are put off and repulsed 
um, by uh, uh, violence and gore and um, um, whereas uh, laughter and, and happiness uh, increases uh, our blood flow. The reasons for the uh, presence of this blood injury phobia reflex have been extensively debated. Some people have suggested that it developed as a way of warding off predation by allegedly playing dead. However, playing dead is not an effective way to ward off predation since a dead bleeding victim is exactly the result a predator is trying to achieve, especially African savanna predators. And that would be important since it's believed that human beings uh, first appeared on the African savanna. Um, and uh, when um, uh, newborn fawns um, are um, left by their mothers to lie motionless on the African savanna, they are not playing dead. These um, uh, newborn fawns are actually born without any scent whatsoever. And so when they are laying motionless, what they are do actually doing is mimicking an inert object. They are basically pretending to be like a rock out there on the savanna. Um, and that's why they don't have any smell. And I told you earlier that carnivores don't have, uh, their eyes are not able to see detail very well. And so as long as that baby fawn doesn't move, if the carnivore can't smell them, they literally cannot differentiate them from the background uh, gravel, rocks, and um, grass on the savanna. And there are um, many, many uh, uh, um, filmed scenes of uh, lions and hyenas walking right past uh, baby animals that held their nerve and didn't get up and run uh, because they could not smell them. They could not uh, uh, detect them um, from the uh, uh, surrounding uh, uh, vegetation and uh, uh, other, uh, I, uh, you know, background uh, items on the savanna. So that is the, the, the purpose of them uh, um, laying motionless. It's not playing dead. It's just so they won't be detected. The sight and smell of blood are stimulatory to carnivores and will spur them to begin feeding once their prey has stopped moving. So if, an animal, if a carnivore is trying to kill you and eat you, playing dead is not going to work. Looking like food will not deter a carnivore bent on obtaining a meal. If playing dead ever works, it usually only works in cases where an animal is seeking to protect its young from a perceived threat. And that is um, uh, what I uh, uh, hope to get across from this Farsight cartoon, um, where the Anderson brothers foolishly were playing with this bear cub. And you can see the mother is about to make short work of the Anderson brothers. And it reads, and no one ever heard from the Anderson brothers again. And so if you are in a situation where um, you come between, say, a mother bear and her cubs, and she attacks because she perceives you, perceives you as a threat to those cubs, in that case, if you um, drop to the ground, cover up, and... Uh, adopt a defensive posture, stop moving, and she no longer perceives you as a threat, then she may very well walk away and leave you alone. And there are cases where that's, that has happened. Um, but if a bear attacks you because they're hungry and want to eat you, playing dead will only get you actually dead. A more likely reason for the existence of the blood injury phobia reflex is to serve as a break um, on the interpersonal conflict in a social species that does not have instinctual ritualized behaviors that regulate and limit such conflicts. Unlike um, most large social mammals, which have ritualized inborn uh, behaviors such as um, um, you know, and, and sexual postures and, and so forth that they adopt towards one another to kind of um, figure out who's the top animal and uh, 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 settle their, their, their um, um, dominance hierarchy. Human beings really don't have those kind of instinctual behaviors. So, but that 
lack of 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 uh, in, uh, instinctual behaviors also allows us a lot of cultural flexibility. But we do need some kind of mechanism to keep us from killing each other, and as a result, we have the blood injury phobia. Uh, blood injury phobia reflex. The, adapt the adaptive significance of an aversion to the sight of blood or mutilation may involve an evolved natural inhibitory influence that serves to prevent the species from unchecked aggression that could lead to self-destruction. So in other words, if we get into you know, conflict and we start beating the crap out of each other, and once we see the sight of blood, we both faint, that keeps us from killing each other. Unfortunately, research and experience have consistently shown that humans can become inured to the sight of blood and our aversion to violence and dismemberment can sadly be overcome by conditioning, training, and socialization. To increase the audience for violence, the vehicle for it is supercharged with the excitement generated by sexual themes and powerful music and given a hard gloss of professionalism enabling the most sordid events to be presented in a brilliant, glittering, ultra-violent light. That's uh, from an article called Vagotonicity of Violence, Biochemical and Cardiac Responses to Violent Films and Television Programs uh, that was published in the British Medical Journal. I forgot to read the citation for the previous uh, uh, quote. Um, this ability to overcome our innate nature has both good and bad aspects. Uh, for example, it's allowed a society to train surgeons, nurses, and paramedics uh, who've been able to save people who've been involved in traumas. But tragically, it has also allowed us to create soldiers, weapons, of uh, uh, mass destructions, and sadly, the atrocity of war. And we see evidence for that over uh, in uh, you, the Ukraine right now. To make war palatable, we use uh, these high sounding evocative words to convince ourselves about things like virility and honor, glory and valor. And in uh, the uh, most recent incarnations in the United States, things like democracy. But sadly, uh, these words are words that resonate only in the ears of living people. We always seem so naively surprised when war, in fact, proves to be hellish, brutal, cruel, ugly, and often pointless. Again and again, we find the pretty words we use are simply lies we tell our youth to entice them into dying, and they're things we tell ourselves so that we will willingly let our young men and women go to their untimely deaths. <sighs> Why did we dehumanize and animalize others? Simply because it is much easier to kill other people and other beings when we deny their essential sameness and their sentience. And this has happened time and time again throughout history. During the Holocaust, Nazis referred to Jews as rats. Uh, Hutus involved in the Rwanda genocide called um, the Tutsis, which were another of another tribe, cockroaches. Uh, slave owners throughout history considered slaves uh, subhuman animals. Uh, that happened in the United States. In the book Less Than Human, David Livingston Smith argues that it is important to define and describe dehumanization because it is what opens the door for cruelty and genocide. Um, if you've been paying attention to what's happening in Ukraine, Putin has been lying and claiming that the Ukrainians were Nazis, and uh, that's why he has to do what he's doing. Uh, people do much the same thing to the animals. Some choose to eat. Science has, science has shown that animals are sentient. They have feelings and emotions. They also experience grief and loss. And these facts should negate the continued wanton slaughter of our fellow earthlings. Uh, Holocaust survivor Alex Hershaft has made these same connections between the inhumanity humans have shown to other humans and the abuse we visit on other animals. And this is a poster from um, a program he gave in August of 2014. 
Humankind's distaste for blood, bloodletting, and violence is probably why we have created specific professional classes such as soldiers, butchers, and executioners to perform tasks we personally find repellent. But then we leave these people uh, in these uh, you know, professional classes to deal with the post-traumatic stress disorder and, uh, and other negative psychological fallout that stem from violating our intrinsic nature. Turns out 20% of Army troops and 42% of National Guard troops that we sent off to uh, fight in the uh, Middle East war, such as the Iraqi war, came home with new mental uh, illness diagnosis, uh, diagnoses. Rather. Suicides in the deployed National Guard's troops were up 82% from 2009 and uh, a whopping 450 uh, percent from 2004. Army suicides doubled between uh, 2001 and 2006, and it looks it turned out that the um, deployments were worse on the National Guard troops than they were on the uh, Army um, uh, infantrymen, and that's very likely because the National Guardsmen were living more of a normal or a life in society and they were kind of snatched out of uh, uh, that normalcy and then suddenly thrust into these war zones. Whereas the uh, um, uh, army infantrymen were somewhat more used to being uh, in a uh, 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 infantry setting. But the bottom line is that a blood injury violence phobia reflex could not, absolutely not, exist in a true predator species because it would clearly be maladaptive for a predator to pass out or become lightheaded and nauseous at a point at which it began to kill its prey, right? Uh, so the human aversion to blood, violence, and dismemberment shows that we are clearly not natural predators. Human anatomy, physiology, disease susceptibilities, and our psychology unequivocally demonstrate we are natural herbivores. While blood gore, and gore elicit a strong disgust response in us, no one has ever passed out from watching someone pick and eat an apple. Well, with the possible exception of Adam. He says, miss, oh, miss, for God's sake, please stop. Well, let's talk about things that are moist, wet, and slimy. Animal flesh in its unaltered form has many, if not most, of the characteristics all human beings find disgusting. If you were to offer a ragged, squishy, wet, slimy, bloody piece of raw flesh to most humans, they simply would not eat it. But carnivores absolutely love it. If people attempted to eat unpreserved, unbutchered raw flesh without cutlery, many would actually die from choking or food poisoning or parasitic infections. That's especially true if the flesh has actually started to rot. It's putrid and covered with flies, beetles, maggots, and other pathogenic bacteria. The smell of rotting flesh is perceived by humans as a malodorous stench. It induces nausea and actually a retching, vomiting reflex in us that will cause us to throw up whatever we have eaten in an attempt to rid our bodies of dangerous and harmful material. I mean, have you ever thought about why smelling something that is rotting makes you throw up? It's, it's, it's again, because we are a social species, it is the body's way of saying, hey, if you uh, uh, come across something that is rotting, it may be that you had already eaten something that hadn't quite gotten to the point where it started to stink, but you could be uh, in danger. So you might as well get rid of what you've already eaten just to be safe. This is the brain's way of saying, don't even think of trying to eat this stuff. Our innate aversion to raw and putrid animal flesh is a survival mechanism meant to protect us from ingesting things we're not designed to eat and that could kill us by causing us to either choke to death or die from infections caused by pathogens such as bacteria, viruses, and parasites. 
Carnivores, by contrast, are actually drawn to decaying flesh, will dine on it for several days with absolutely no ill effects. In fact, during times of war, there have been many unfortunate instances of carnivores digging up and dining on the uh, uh, buried, decomposing corpses of dead soldiers and civilians. Then looking at things that are asymmetric, covered with fur and blood. The reasons we skin, pluck, and drain the blood from uh, animal flesh, flesh and then cut and shape it into these smooth-edged, rounded, hand-sized objects is so that it will mimic edible plant parts and thereby circumvent our innate disgust response. We're trying to make this stuff look like plants. Why is smooth, annular, which means rounded, symmetry in food so attractive and important to us? Because asymmetry in plant tissues is usually a sign or signal of disease and hence equates with poor nutritive value. When plants are well watered and receive adequate sunlight, nitrogen and minerals, their tissues and fruits and seed pods are usually very symmetrical and well formed. This symmetry or beauty signals that these items are likely packed with nutrients or health promoting and therefore are more desirable, which is why you don't go to the supermarket and pick the, you know, rotted or brown or uh, uh, diseased looking fruits or the ones that are misshapen and, and, and uh, um, uh, you know, discolored. You want the ones that are perfectly shaped and, and beautifully colored because your brain is telling you, yeah, that's the one that's going to be most nutritious and taste best. When, when however, plants are stressed by drought, nutrient-poor soil, inadequate sunlight, or infected or infested with insects or fungal parasites, their tissues and products, uh, such as fruits, leaves, seeds, pods, etc., tend to be shrunken, shriveled, misshapen, and discolored, which are signs that these tissues are very likely nutrient deficient. By contrast, true predators actually desire and actually look for asymmetry in their prey. When carnivores go out to hunt, if they see an antelope that has three legs, that's the one they're going to chase. If they see one that, you know, has a tumor growing out the neck, that's the one they're going to chase. Why? Because that one is easier to catch and eat. They don't want the one that's big and robust uh, and that looks the, like it, 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 it uh, has been uh, uh, competing in the WWE because that's the one that's likely to hurt them or either run away from them and they will have wasted their time trying to chase it. So it's a completely opposite uh, uh, type of dynamic. Species survival in nature is fundamentally a question of energy out versus in energy in. If animals spend more, expend more energy procuring their food than they can extract from the food they obtain, they starve to death, cease to exist as a species. For this reason, all true predator species actually seek out ugly food. That is, they desire food that requires a minimum expenditure, expenditure of energy to obtain. This means they will not and do not waste time and energy pursuing the strongest, healthiest, uh, or fittest members of prey species. Instead, they pursue the sick, old, lame, stupid, or very young, and they look for food that is already dead, in other words, carrying it. When they behave in this manner, that ensures they will ultimately strengthen the gene pool of the prey species of their prey species by weeding out the less fit. And by contrast, herbivores seek beautiful food. They want the fresh, verdant, vibrant foliage and fruit because that is the uh, plants. Those are the plants that are most nutritious. When we, because of our herbivore mindset, cull and kill off the most beautiful and robust members of species that we choose to prey on, we actually weaken the gene pool of these species and we drive them to extinction. By contrast, eating and spreading the seeds of the healthiest plants actually help ensure the survival of those particular plant species. Uh, now, what about moist, wet, and squishy? Well, the reason we season and cook flesh is because those manipulations dry it out and give it the firm texture and taste of plants. That's why all the seasonings that we use are actually plants. We cover this dead tissue with uh, plant parts and then cook it to make it firm and have the texture of, of, of plants. Nobody wants a squishy, wet, mushy apple that's rotting. We, we want a firm uh, apple. And, and that's what we do to the animal uh, uh, flesh to make it, you know, firm so that it has that, that texture we want. Cooking is an entirely unnatural behavior. And we can't eat animal tissue 
unless it's cooked in general. So the primary way humans tolerate flesh is by consuming it in an unnatural fashion. This is because we humans have the palate and preferences of a herbivore. We naturally love and crave the taste, textures, colors, and variety of plant foods. Why do we grill, smoke, and barbecue? Well, it's because wood smoke is actually a flavoring that's created when intense heat breaks down plant tissues into some of the same aromatics that are found in true spicings. That's a quote from a book called On Food and Cooking by an author named McGee. Roasting does not sterilize meat. Um, and so the origin and purpose of cooking flesh was not hygienic. It was uh, most likely to impart the taste and texture of plants to animal flesh. People didn't roast animal tissue because it made it sterile. It doesn't make it sterile. Uh, and you find that out every Thanksgiving when people end up in the emergency room from un undercooked turkey. And they cook that turkey in a, uh, a stainless steel range that costs a couple thousand dollars. So there's, if you can't sterilize turkey in a modern uh, um, gas or electric range, there's no way you're going to sterilize it, burning it up over uh, uh, an open flame on the savannah. But what you will do is make it taste like that wood that you're cooking it over. And, and I'll make it taste a whole lot better than uh, just eating it raw. The spices and herbs we use to flavor meat and fish are all plants, plant parts or derived from plants. In effect, we try to make the meat and fish taste like plants. The spice trade has been a major economic importance throughout human history, and it actually helped spur the age of exploration. Uh, Columbus, with his uh, did self, was actually looking for uh, the spice islands uh, uh, when he stumbled into the New World. And it turns out only herbivores have a taste for and actually seek out salt. Even when dying from sodium depletion, carnivores will not seek or even eat salt. And they sadly discovered that in the 1950s when they depleted dog chow of sodium and put a little dish of salt right next to the dog chow. The dogs would eat their uh, food every day, never touch the salt, and eventually died from sodium depletion. Whereas for humans, searching for salt has been a major pursuit in every society. Throughout history, salt has been an important and prized commodity. Cities were often founded in places with natural salt formations. The word salary and soldier actually uh, originally meant salt. Our manipulations of animal flesh are all designed to circumvent our disgust reflex. We try to make meat taste and smell like plants by cooking, seasoning, and marinating it in herbs, spices, and other plant products. We give it the texture of plants by bleeding, drying, cooking, and breading, and frying it. Moreover, we make it look like plants by skinning, plucking, cutting, and shaping, and covering it with brightly colored sauces and garnishes. Tests repeatedly show humans uh, uh, often like crispy and crunchy uh, mouthfeel, but these are not the textures of raw animal flesh. I mean, wake up, folks. Ah, uh, but what about the fish? Well, what about fish? Well, some people say, well, you know, sashimi is the name given to the Japanese inspired practice of eating raw fish and or the raw fish itself. And some have wondered if this practice sort of, you know, uh, countermands many of the arguments that I made in this lecture. Well, no, the answer is no. Why do I say that? First of all, this is actual sashimi, okay? Um, brown bears who are true omnivores get 70% of their calories from plant foods. These animals eat raw fish in its actual, natural, unaltered form. They catch live, wriggling fish, rip them apart, and consume them, bones and all. That's real sash sashimi. For humans, that practice would be absolutely repulsive and also dangerous because you get bones lodged in your throat and you'd end up uh, killing yourself. Let's look what, at what we do. When humans eat raw fish, it bears no resemblance to the actual animal it came from. As typical for ingested animal flesh, the fish is also bled, skinned, and cut into smooth-sized, uh, smooth-edged, hand-sized objects. 
and it's usually eaten accompanied by plant foods uh, and products such as soy sauce, ginger, rice, and wasabi to make it more palatable. And visually, it actually still mimics plant parts. We make it look like fruit. So again, we're still doing the same thing. And then this begs the question, is eating fish even healthy for human beings? Watch this short video by Dr. Michael Greger from nutritionfacts.org. These data on BMAA neurotoxin concentrations in animals in South Florida waters indicate that the situation in Guam is not unique. It looks like BMAA could be found in high concentrations in aquatic animals in many areas of the world. This could explain ALS clustering around lakes in New Hampshire, up to 25 times the expected rate of ALS, with some families eating fish several times a week or in Wisconsin, where the most significant ALS risk factor was the past consumption of fish out of Lake Michigan, or clustering in Finland's Lakeland district, or maybe seafood eaters in France, or around the Baltic Sea, building up particularly in fish mussels and oysters. When I think algae blooms, I think uh, the Chesapeake Bay, near where I live, that gets choked off thanks in part to the uh, poultry industry pollution. And indeed, there was a recent report linking BMAA exposure to ALS in Maryland. Uh, ALS victims living within a half mile of each other raised some eyebrows at the Hopkins ALS Center. Uh, the victims each ate uh, Chesapeake blue, uh, Bay blue crabs every week, and so they tested a few, and two out of the three crabs tested positive for BMAA, indicating that the neurotoxin is present in the aquatic food chain of the Chesapeake Bay and a potential route for human exposure. To bring the story full circle, things in Guam are looking up. The ALS epidemic there may have been triggered by their acquisition of guns. But now the epidemic appears to be over thanks to the near extinction of fruit bats due to overhunting. But while the rates decline in Guam, neurodegenerative diseases like ALS around the rest of the world are on the rise. It's plausible that humans have been exposed to some level of BMAA through our evolutionary history, but the increase in algae blooms as a result of human activities is probably increasing this exposure. There's a general consensus that harmful algal, algal blooms are increasing worldwide thanks in part to industrialized agriculture. More people means more sewage, fertilizer, manure, uh, which may mean more algae, which may mean more exposure to this neurotoxin, leading to a possible increased incidence of neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and ALS. BMAA is a strong contender as the cause of, or at least a major contributor to the cause of both endemic and sporadic ALS and Alzheimer's disease, and possibly conferring risk for Parkinson's disease as well. The ramifications of this discovery are enormous. With substantial and ever-growing evidence that BMAA does play a role in the onset and progression of neurodegenerative diseases, the most important question is, what mode of activity does BMAA exert? What? <laughs> no, it's not. The most important question is how do we reduce our risk? We know that the presence of BMAA in aquatic food chains could be a significant human health hazard. There may even be a synergistic toxicity between mercury and BMAA, making certain fish even riskier. Until more is known about the possible link of BMAA to Alzheimer's and ALS, it may be prudent to limit exposure of BMAA in the human diet. And this is just to uh, show you guys that fish um, uh, and other aquatic animals are some of the most toxin and parasite-laden uh, tissue you can put in your body. She's pulling out tapeworms uh, from uh, uh, fish. And this goes for wild caught as well as um, uh, um, farm-raised. Uh, um, this is, it's not healthy. It is. Um, uh, um, filled with parasites. It's, it's uh, uh, again, heavily laden with toxins and heavy metals. It is absolutely not 
healthy to eat. So um, bottom line is um, trying to eat animal flesh is just a ghastly pop proposition. In summary, we do not like animal flesh and its unaltered native form. So why do we seek to dis circumvent our disgust response? Why do we do this in the first place? In order to circumvent our disgust reflex, we find it necessary to extensively modify animal flesh by skinning, plucking, cutting, shaping, uh, cooking, and flavoring it to mimic the look, taste, texture, and size of edible plants and plant parts. Humans found it necessary to do this to overcome our innate aversion and disgust response to animal flesh so that we could use animals for the calories that weren't available from plants in temperate areas during winter months. Why did humans develop a disgust response to animal flesh in the first place? Because for an herbivorous species in a primitive environment, eating flesh carries a significant risk of death from choking or gastrointestinal infection. In equatorial regions, plant foods are abundant year round and attempting to hunt is actually energetically wasteful because the energy content of wild plant foods and wild game are nearly equal, such that expending energy trying to hunt does not improve survival. Furthermore, hunting carries a risk of serious injury or premature death, which would significantly reduce the chances of successfully raising young and propagating one's genes. While plant foods are in fact much more nutritious than wild game because they have a higher content of vitamins, antioxidants, phytochemicals, and fiber, and they lack the pathogenic bacteria and viruses that uh, animal tissue has. And lastly, a distaste for violence and killing is a necessary prerequisite for a social species whose survival was dependent upon cooperation, interdependence, and the sharing of food resources. Killing is so antithetical to our nature that in every society, all killing, whether animal or human, must be considered justifiable. Killing for the sake of killing is universally viewed as reprehensible in all human societies. And that's in direct contrast to carnivores who kill without any reservation or remorse whatsoever. Out of our inherited aversion to bloodletting and violence grows our sense of morality and ethics, which causes us to create laws and judicial systems. It also leads us to reject and ostracize selfish, violence-prone individuals and to promote the concept of the greater good through philanthropy, cooperation, caring, and sharing. And these are just some examples. So, we need to learn to embrace what is our true and natural diet. While learning to get around our innate aversion to eating animal flesh may have conferred survival advantages in the past, as we migrated out of equatorial regions to temperate areas where plant foods weren't abundant year round, clearly that is no longer the case. We now have very ready access to plant foods year round. We have supermarkets, we can grow our food. Um, there is no longer a problem with us obtaining um, very nutritious, a uh, wide variety of plant foods throughout the year. Plant foods are abundant, ready available uh, everywhere throughout the calendar year. Medical science has conclusively shown a plant-based diet is without question the healthiest diet humans can consume once we are weaned. It actually turns out it's also the best diet for our planet. That begs the question, how green is your diet? 
animal waste agriculture is one of the major contributors to the massive increases in greenhouse gases that uh, we see, such as carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, and methane that are responsible for accelerating global warming and uh, uh, causing climate change. After energy production, raising animals for consumption is the number one cause of global warming and climate change. It's responsible for at least 18% of greenhouse gas emissions, and that is more than all of the uh, greenhouse gases produced by all of the cars, trucks, trains, and planes combined. And uh, the asterisk point at, points out that cattle emits huge amounts of methane that actually has a warming effect that is 20 times, 23 times greater than carbon dioxide. They also emit nitrous oxide that has a warming effect that is 296 times greater than carbon dioxide. And um, at more than 7 billion, is, I think now it's up to 7.5 billion individuals, human beings display the classic population dynamics of a typical social herbivore mammalian species. And what that means is that all large body social um, um, uh, herbivore species uh, or social mammals are herbivores uh, because the planet simply can't produce enough animal protein to support large bodied animals in those numbers. Um, uh, it, there's just not enough land area to do it. Switching to um, vegetarian or preferably a vegan diet will reduce your carbon footprint by more than one and a half tons of carbon dioxide a year. And that is more than if you change to a hybrid car, which is why I tell people if you drive a Prius or some other hybrid car and still eat meat, you clearly need a lot more fiber in your diet. 70% of the corn grown in the U.S. Uh, each year is used for animal feed, and that requires 17 times more land, 14 times more water, and 10 times more energy than if people ate the plant foods directly. Books such as Beyond Beef, The Empty Ocean, and Water Follies document the destructive impact our animal food addiction has on our planet. Um, uh, movies such as Cowspiracy and Seaspiracy also uh, highlight uh, the destruction we are um, visit, uh, causing upon the environment through um, the uh, um, uh, consumption of animal foods. And Beyond Beef, Jeremy Rifkin highlights the true cost of and problems associated with beef production, including the famine, waste, and environmental destruction resulting from overgrazing cattle and raising rainforests to raise beef for export. Since 1970, more than 25% of Central American rainforests have been cleared for pasture land for cattle. He also discusses the toxic effects of the billions of tons of animal waste, uh, more than 11 thousand tons produced per second and the misuse of uh, water resources more than 50 percent of animal of annual u.s water use is uh, being used for raising livestock and the massive amounts of fossil fuels um, that are used as both fuel and petroleum-based fertilizer that is used to grow grain that is then turned around um, and used for animal feed and fossil fuel based farming contributes to global warming by using non-renewable and poorly recycled forms of carbon, again, both as fuel and as fertilizer. While Rifkin books, Rifkin's book only deals with beef, the issues that he discussed are also germane to poultry and pork production as well. And runoff from hog farms has caused massive, massive fish kills and disease due to the steria bacteria. And it also uh, causes horrific uh, health problems for uh, individuals who are unfortunate not enough to live uh, in areas where these hog farms are located. Um, uh, in the uh, movie um, called They're Trying to Kill Us, um, the uh, uh, directors, um, uh, John Lewis and um, Keegan Kuhn uh, point out the um, uh, uh, elevated rates of death and disease amongst the poor Black individuals who are um, unfortunate enough to be located near these 
tremendous uh, um, hog manure lagoons. Um, they have uh, just uh, um, all kinds of disease that comes from uh, the uh, um, fact that this 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 manure gets in the air, it gets in the soil, gets in the groundwater, um, and these people are being just abused and mistreated by these companies. Uh, so um, um, this these animal food addictions are not benign and they're killing uh, not only the environment and other animals, but human beings as well. And water follies, Robert Glennon explores the negative impact our overuse of groundwater for irrigation and agribusiness has on the environment, including ground salinization, and how our misuse of our water resources pretends a crisis of widespread water scarcity. And many people predict that future wars will be fought over the scarcity of fresh water. Researchers also predict that as global warming progresses, sea levels will rise, and widespread drought will become common potentially inciting wars and other international conflicts over the declining sources of fresh water and arable land. The empty ocean documents how human predation has caused the collapse of many major fish stocks, threatens others, many species have declined by more than 90%. Uh, Richard Ellis argues human activities are driving many marine species towards extinction. Many animals are killed and discarded as unwanted bycatch, such as this uh, 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 sea turtle, and destroying the, we are destroying the architecture of the oceans by scouring reefs through reckless, indiscriminate bottom trawling for uh, shrimp. This is a reef before bottom trawling, and then this is what it looks like afterwards. A 2006 census study projects that all commercially fished species will collapse by 2050 if current fishing trends continues. And again, the movie Seaspiracy uh, did a devastating expose of commercial fishing and its impact on our oceans. And then there's the overt versus covert environmental damage. The preceding instances of how our animal food-based diets negatively affect the environment were examples of just overt human impact, but then there are less direct but equally harmful covert instances of the negative impact our dietary choices have on the environment. An example is the human driven depletion of wild salmon populations in the Pacific Northwest. Salmon are the currency of biological rich uh, richness. Uh, and that statement comes from a PBS uh, Nature Special. Turns out that alpine rivers, springs, and streams are very clear and clean, but that also means that they are naturally nutrient poor. The annual and often year long migration of uh, various species of ocean matured salmon upstream to their birth rivers and tributaries actually represents a massive and necessary transfer of nutrients from the oceans back to those river watershed ecosystems. Studies showed that 80% of the nitrogen found in the uh, uh, ecosystems of the Pacific Northwest actually came from the oceans. Salmon deliver nutrients directly to the rivers and streams, and then when they die and decay in situ uh, after, after spawning, but they also enrich the entire ecosystem by becoming food for animals and insects, and then fertilizing the plant life through droppings that are deposited by the organisms that are fed on them, as well as by the bodies of those animals that eat them after they die. While the primary cause of the decline in sediment populations is habitat destruction, again, from human activities and the damming of river, river systems, the unnecessary added pressure of commercial fishing, which accounts for more than 100,000 tons per year of salmon caught and carried away by humans, constitutes a potentially unsustainable, deleterious, discretionary burden of questionable validity. You know, you're destroying the environment for a salmon croquette. Um, by contributing to the depletion of Pacific salmon runs, we are damaging entire ecosystems in unknown ways because we are removing a major source of vital nutrients from these ecosystems. Given that these ecosystems developed over millennia dependent on the annual infusion of marine nutrients and organic material into the environment by returning Pacific salmon, it is safe. It is a safe inference that the massive and long-term removal of these nutrients cannot help but have baleful and far-reaching effects on both the fauna and flora of these regions. 
When we catch and consume large por- amounts of Pacific salmon, we are in effect interrupting nutrients nature had targeted to the Northwestern ecosystems and tying them up in our bodies. We then eventually lock those nutrients away in the sediment of sewage treatment plants, the detritus of landfill and septic tanks, and in cemeteries that are far removed from their intended destinations. What the ultimate impact and effects of this wholesale transfer of nutrients out of and away from these ecosystems will be is as yet unclear and may not be fully known for generations. At some point in our future, assuming there is one, when magnificent species like bluefin tuna and swordfish no longer exist, children will ask what became of these ancient, ineffable, and irreplaceable creatures. And I wonder, what will we tell them? What are we going to say? That we destroyed them for something as ephemeral, crass, and unimportant as the way they taste it. Because if that's all we will be able to say, that will truly be a tragic and sad legacy. I suggest we listen to our inner selves and return to the diet that we were meant to eat, a plant-based diet. So in closing, our ability as humans to reprogram ourselves is both our greatest strength and our greatest weakness. The plasticity and adaptability of human cultures have allowed us to colonize and exploit every corner of the globe, but they've also caused us to become the most rapacious, cruel, and environmentally destructive organism the world has ever known. Where moving beyond our natural diet once conferred survival advantages on peripatetic adventurers, it now imperils our, imperils our health and wreaks havoc on the earth and its ecology. We have been spectacularly successful as a species, but that very success makes it more important than ever that we learn to live within our true ecological niche as herbivores. We must do this not only for our own health and collective well-being, but for the benefit of the planet and its other inhabitants as well. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for your time and attention. And I hope that this has been um, a beneficial and enlightening lecture for you all. Thank you for your uh, time and attention. All right, thank you, Dr. Mills. Oh, where'd you go? Um, I'm here, um, trying to stop share. Oh, um, well, I You're guess awesome. I do have one, one last slide. Uh, this is from the book of Isaiah. Uh, it says, the time will come where the wolf shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, the cow and the bear shall graze, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord. That's Isaiah 11, verses 6, 7, and 9. Let's pray that that day will come soon. All right. So um, if you wouldn't mind stopping, share for me, because somehow there we right, there right. I'm, okay, I'm back. Yes. <laughs> All right, so All right. Uh, thanks for that, Dr. Mills. Great presentation. Um, first of all, before we start the Q&A, um, is there any place uh, where people can follow up with you, you know, your website, or where would that be? Um, well, I, I think we, at the beginning, we gave uh, the address that they can write to, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then uh, um, they can always, uh, you know, find additional information on my website and, uh um, well, uh, I, I will also eventually put up um, a place on the website where they can also um, send questions and, and so forth. Great. Thanks for sharing that with us. All right. All right. So um, before we get to the q and I just want to let everyone know what's going to happen. Um, we normally don't take questions directly from the chat. Instead, we ask everyone to virtually raise your hand. 
To do this, you go to the bottom of your Zoom window. There should be a reactions uh, tab there. Click that and then click on the raise hand function. Then we'll see your raised hand in our window. Um, we'll then take questions in the order which we receive them. When it's your turn, we'll unmute you and prompt you to ask your questions. And with that, let's go ahead and get started. Dr. Mills, are you ready? I'm ready. Ready? All right, let's go. So we have uh, Shanti. Shanti, what is your question? Hi, Dr. Mills. I am so happy to talk to you. Um, I am a huge fan of all of your work and I enjoy all of your talks. I just have devoured them all. And I really love your approach to educating and informing because it's totally different from anybody else that I've listened to. And I've listened to a lot. I um, was born and raised a uh, vegan, whole food plant-based. Oh, wonderful. 45 years old. And it was actually in a very spiritual household. So um, that was always incorporated. Uh, and I'm very, very blessed to have had such an experience. And I've enjoyed excellent health for my entire 45 years most everybody thinks I'm half my age, but I really have just learned so much from your talks and it's expanded my mind because so many things that I really never thought about, even with years of studying and being very active. So I just appreciate it so much. I really, you're like one of my heroes and I'm just trying to keep up with everything I can find of your work. And so my question it's just actually all of these wonderful insights that you have, like about how the difference in the protein content of the milk of, you know, carnivores versus herbivores, or how our body is actually cooling our brain, like all these wonderful things. Like, how did you actually, or how were you inspired to to research these kinds of details as far as, I mean, I'm taking it as like a divine direction because it's just, it connects so many things that are so logical once you hear them. But personally, because I never ate meat, like even this talk today, when you don't eat it and you're young, you were like, you're trying to understand why is, why is it like this? Because if you're raised without the conditioning, it's very confusing. So a lot of this, too, has made such clarity around things you struggle with if if you have the good fortune of of being supported as a person and an indiv individual to toward health, toward compassion and toward, you know, taking care of the earth. So, yeah, my question is, it's, what was your inspiration with? kind of researching all of these details that many of us would just never think of, but they make total sense. <laughs> uh, um, well, you, you really hit the nail on the head and it, it was, um, um, and, and, and a lot of people won't understand when I, when I, when I say this, that it was um, a divine tutorial that, 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 that God kind of, tutored me and 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 i don't mean that in a um in a um a uh non-scientific sense because i mean god created the universe and he created it according to scientific principles and and he helped open up science to me to show me exactly how he put these things together and um for instance the genesis of this well, actually, uh, of this talk was I was reading in the psychological literature one day about the science, the emo, um, emotion of disgust. And as I'm reading, I'm reading about the elicitors of disgust. And then he just started talking to me and, and pointing things out. And and it just took off from there. And and so, yeah, it it it. It, I, I just have to say it was a divine tutorial uh, based on the science that I was learning um, in, in medical school and in undergraduate school. Um, um, and yes, it did re really tie things together and help uh, things make so much sense. Um, so, 
I had an intuition that's what it was because it yes. really strikes you in the heart that way of, oh my God, this is so beautiful because it makes so much sense. And I just wanted to offer one more thing that I found recently that was really interesting is I was reading some information from Rudolf Steiner and it, it actually went into um, about eating animal protein and animal fat and how in an evolutionary sense, it was, it's, linked to the ability of humans to actually generate spiritual focus, uh, direction, and integrity that the animals are helping to provide that. And it's up to humans to actually come to um, be able to generate that on their own. So it was a really interesting older talk, but I'm just sharing that because along with your um, you, what I've learned from you, that was really helpful just as far as um, making sense of why it is that this is so prevalent and why we're at this tipping point right now on the planet. So thank you so, so much for your work. Bless you and may you be healthy and strong for so many more years so we can learn more from you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Take care. You too. Um, am I, who's going right, to, thank you. Thank so, you. Sean, sorry. For that. Um, sorry about week, that. Uh, you know what, John? Sorry. I got it. I got it. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, the next, the next person is, um, um, Sean, we did Sean, did we do Sean? Yeah, we, already? We did, we, yeah, okay, we did right, Sean. That, that would be, it would be Benny. Benny. Okay. No, I think it's Linda. It was, oh, oh, you know um, what? I, 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 yes. th okay. Okay. All right, Linda, great. Go ahead. Hi, Dr. Mills. I wanted to get your thoughts about um, the, the fake meats, like beyond beef and things like that, because they sure. do really make them to look like beef. And so if you're talking about, you know, the repulsion right. of things that look like meat, but then the synthetics that do their best to look like meat. So I just wanted right. to get your thoughts about those. Sure. Well, you know, it, it's kind of a Victor Victoria thing, because remember, the meats are made to actually mimic plant parts. And and then because of our cultural habits, we then take <laughs> plants and make them look like meats that are actually made to mimic plants. So um, I, I think that because of, of, of our cultural conditioning, you know, um, people have taken these um, plant proteins and made them look like things that are familiar for people so that they can transition in a, cult, uh, a comfortable fashion. And then I, I, I want to also allay some concerns that people have about, are these things uh, healthy uh, or can they be used in a healthy fashion? And uh, there is um, um, uh, there, there was a study done at Stanford University where they <clears throat> compared the Beyond um, beef products to regular meat and it was a, a eight week crossover study uh, where they had two groups the for, uh, for four weeks, uh, one group was eating the Beyond product and the other group was eating meat at the crossover point, the Beyond group switched over to meat and the uh, meat group switched over to Beyond products. And what they showed was consistently while people, while the, uh, people were eating the Beyond product, their cholesterol dropped their weight drop, their blood pressure drop, and importantly, their level of this very toxic compound called TMAO went down. Um, but when they started eating meat again, it went back up. While they were eating meat, everything was up. When they switched to the Beyond, it went down. So um, what that says is that there is no question that the Beyond product is healthier than, than uh, dead animal tissue. Uh, that is not to say you should build your whole diet around these these. Uh, um, uh, artificial meats, but that they, when used judiciously and properly um, as an, an occasional part of your diet, um, they can be uh, uh, a helpful part of the diet. Now, um, I, as I told someone last night, the, the thing you don't want to do is like when you look at the way uh, Americans typically eat a meal, there's this giant slab of animal tissue and a vegetable garnish. We shouldn't be doing that with the plant meats either. You want to have, you know, uh, if you use them, a small portion, the majority of what you eat should always be unprocessed plant foods, okay? That you want to make sure that whatever plate of food you consume, uh, if, you, if you're using a, a, a Beyond Burger or a Beyond Sausage, that, that most of what you're eating are 
unprocessed whole plants with maybe a small portion of, uh, you know, beyond meat, or you chop it up and use it, you know, uh, distribute it throughout the, uh, um, you know, the prepared dish, but that, again, the, the majority of what you're eating um, are unprocessed plant foods, and that a significant portion of that is raw. Thank you so much. You're um, welcome. The next person, yep, the next person up is, is Benny. Uh, Benny, I'm gonna unmute you if you could please ask a question. Thanks so much, doctor. You know, sadly, the discussed mechanism doesn't seem to be working, especially with the resurgence of hunting in this country. My theory is the biggest impediment. Oh, sorry, sorry, that was me. Uh, please, can you repeat the question, Ben? Sure. I, sadly, the, the discussed mechanism doesn't seem to be working, especially with the resurgence of hunting in this country. My theory is the biggest impediment to people changing their diet is it's because of what our mothers cooked and our fathers ate and their mothers and fathers. So do you have any approach to overcome the family tradition of eating meat? Yeah, so, um, I mean, you're right that, and, and I, point, I tried to point that out um, in, in the lecture that we can overcome our innate nature by training cultural habits. But the thing that I always point out to people is that nobody asks for fried chicken, pork chops, ice cream, or, you know, a hamburger in the delivery room. As babies, we are all born without preferences. Anything we think we like, somebody taught us to like. And, um, and so whatever someone thinks they like, they can unlearn that habit. And, you know, I, I also frequently ask my uh, people who attend my lectures, I, I ask a show of hands, how many of you are in a relationship? Most of the hands go up. And then I say, how many of you are in a relationship with the very first person you fell in love with? And almost all of the hands go down. And I say, I then ask them, think back to the very first person you fell in love with. There was a time you thought you couldn't live or breathe without being around that person. And then that person did something stupid or terrible and you realize you shouldn't be with that individual and you got rid of them and you found someone better or kinder or more wonderful and you fell in love with that person and now you can't imagine being without them. Well, you can do the same thing with your diet. You can learn to live without this food that's killing you, that's destroying your health, that's destroying the planet, that is abusing other creatures. You don't have to stay um, wedded to an unhealthy diet. And so the bottom line is that the beautiful thing about human beings is that we are plastic creatures in the sense of we always have the potential for change. And no matter how you were raised, you can change and you can change for the better. And we must do that. Do you have any comment on the Inuits? Uh, what about them? Well, you know, people in northern climates, they, they eat the whales or you know, they're, they're one of the examples uh, carnivores say that's how they eat and they're not going to become plant eaters up in the Arctic. Well, you, I mean, um, I, the, the, so, I mean, all I can say is that, that the, the Inuits, when they were living in the Arctic um, and did not have access to um, uh, plant foods, yeah, they um, they developed a culture that relied heavily on animal foods. But um, Inuits living a traditional Inuit lifestyle had a lifespan of about 45 years before they died. OK, um, and uh, there were a lot of health problems associated with that. Um, they now have access to plant foods. They can now live a much longer and healthier life if they don't eat a traditional lifestyle. I don't see any reason to stay wedded to that lifestyle now that we know there are healthier ways to live, now that they have access to healthier food. So it's a, it's a choice that I would encourage them to make. Um, you know, that's like uh, people who are raised in the deep South, many of them were raised to be bigots. Should they hold on to that lifestyle because that's the way their grandparents were raised or that's the culture they were brought up in? No, you know better, do better, period. Thanks so much. Next one up is Aaron. I'm going to unmute you if you could ask your question. Hi, doctor. Thank you so much for your presentation. 
I would like to, to ask if you can elaborate a little bit, what, what is your thought about additional uh, oils into the plant-based diets, such as olive oil and flaxseed oil, and particularly if uh, a vegan have a serious deficiency in omega-3, how would you suggest to deal with it? Thank you. Sure. Um, I think, first of all, I think, I, I, I think that it, how much oil one should have in your diet depends on your state of health. So for uh, someone, say, who is uh, fighting heart disease or cancer, if I were that person or if that person were a patient of mine, I would want them to try and limit the amount of fat in their diet to 10% of, of calories or, or less. You can't have zero fat because you need some essential oils. Um, but if you are not currently dealing with cancer or heart disease, I think you can target the amount of fat in your diet to around uh, 15, uh, to less than 20%. So, you know, 15 is about the sweet spot, I think. Um, and that means you can use a limited amount of uh, um, a monounsaturated fat like olive or walnut oil, but you really do want to limit the added oils because, again, they are refined, they are calorie dense, um, um, but I think you can use a limited amount. It's, it's best if you um, uh, try and use um, foods like nuts or um, um, uh, avocados where the oils haven't been separated. But if you use, you know, a small amount in cooking, um, 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 you know, every now and then, I think that's okay. Um, but you, again, you want to be very judicious and limit the amount. We may be able to All squeeze right. in one last question. One more, yeah, sure, sure. Let's go with uh, Alejandro. Alejandro, what is your question? Hi, Dr. Milton Mills. Thank you for being here. I uh, just want to share that uh, I've been uh, on a whole food vegan diet now for two and a half years. And uh, you were actually one of the first, very first people to inspire me. Um, I lost my grandmother to heart disease conditions at the Andrew. And so I decided to make the switch and I just want to thank you and uh, for, for your service to humanity. And um, also my question to you would be, what is your top two favorite uh, health documentaries? Oh, wow. Uh, my top two favorite. Uh, oh gosh, you would put me on the spot. Like, right. Um, I, you know what? I'm not going to say what the health because I'm in what health. So I'm going to say uh, uh, Game Changers. Um, and uh, it's a tie between uh, They're Trying to Kill Us and Forks Over Knives. Uh, they're Trying to Kill Us is coming out. Um, so look for it. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> All right. Uh, it's uh, 6.59. So I think they're going to... Uh, Pull out the shepherd's rod and put me off yep. the stage. Yep, thanks, thanks, Doctor Mills. Yeah, thank you for. It's been my pleasure, you guys. Yep. So, uh, you know, uh, it's good to have you back, and also yes. I want to say uh, to the audience, what do you have to say for Doctor Mills? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.